Um, the next post that we're picking up on is actually a guest post from a PhD student uh, called James Heathers, who is at the University of Sydney. And he gives an interesting take on this nature versus nurture argument. And he uh, prompts a different way of looking at it rather than nature being the way all of us is formed, and by us I mean our <laughs> mind, who we are as people, mm. um, he says rather than attributing, uh, attributing it solely to nature or to nurture, what they've actually shown, what some research is suggesting at the moment, is that it's a combination of the two, which sounds like a, a kind of obvious response. <laughs> but more than that, they go into quite detail and they look at levels of susceptibility to natural influences. Um, conferred by small changes in your genes. So they actually identify this sequence of genes called 5-HTTLPR, um, just because they really like giving things easy <laughs> names. And it turns out if you have a shorter version of this gene, then you're more susceptible to environmental um, to environmental factors on your mood and the stability of your mood mm. and various other bits like this. It's, it's preliminary results at the moment, but it does show some really, really interesting relationships. Uh, he does actually finish off by noting that it's really, really hard to test this without becoming really, really unethical. Because um, obviously going in, changing the genes, and then seeing how the kids turned out would be one way of testing that hypothesis, but I don't think that would get ethical permission. No, the, the ethics tribunals are not going to be loving that. But, <laughs> but certainly a very interesting correlation at the moment, and, and bears uh, more researching. And the next post that we're talking about is a kind of follow-on from the Nobel Prize. One of our bloggers... Um, Sorry, David Winter from the Atavism, who we keep mentioning for some reason, or it's really good stuff, uh, notes that just because you've won a Nobel Prize doesn't mean that you're A, a great scientist, or B, completely uh, with it upstairs. <laughs> he notes some of the bigger examples of people that have won a Nobel Prize and then gone on to just do mad stuff. There's uh, Linus Pauling, who won the Chemistry and Peace Nobel Prizes, that went on to believe that vitamin C can solve... Anything. all of Earth's problems, and I do mean all of them. <laughs> um, there was Carrie Mullis, who won the PH, uh, so, sorry, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and then became an HIV denialist, as well as all sorts what? of other mad things. William Schottke, the guy that invented the transistor, he was a physicist, and then he went on to say that all people with low IQs and all black people should be um, systematically sterilized to make the world a better place. Wow. Brian Josephson, also from physics, um, he got his PhD in superconductivity, uh, then went on, has gone on, I should say, to study, study parapsychology in the world of quantum mysticism. Um, Luc Montagne, I don't know how to pronounce this, Luc Montagnier, <laughs> who got the Nobel Prize in medicine, um, then went on to become an avid supporter of homeopathy, eventually starting his own journal, because that was the only place he could get his stuff published, oh and my. he published three papers uh, which got accepted, revised, and published within a three-day period, which sent all kinds of alarm <laughs> bells ringing. They were his own papers, he was well. the only editor of his own <laughs> journal, and essentially they said that DNA could teleport between different parts of water and finally but certainly not um the the last example of this is nico tinbergen from um nobel prize in medicine that went on to support a refrigerator mother theory essentially saying that autism and schizophrenia were caused by the relationships between mother and mothers and their children it was completely and utterly false but it caused a whole bunch of people a whole bunch of grief so you know yeah. a little bit of skepticism <laughs> and criticism goes a long way, even from people with Nobel Prizes. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and staying on uh, the Nobel thing, but in fact now talking about the Ig Nobels, because those of you who follow them will also know that they came out this week. Um, the Ig Nobels uh, are designed to, well, they're a sort of very sweet lampooning of, of the Nobel Prizes, and the idea is they're awarded to research which first makes you laugh and then makes you think. As we mentioned in quite detail last week. <laughs> yeah. And um, so if you are interested in hearing a little bit more about them, um, I was actually on a podcast earlier this week, an Australian podcast called Science on Top, and four of us sat down, and for about half an hour, we, we talked through all of this year's uh, winners, which ones we liked, uh, how they all worked, and I also got to tell the story of the Ig Nobel, which was awarded a number of years ago, to uh, research into a problem that New Zealand farmers had in the sort of 1930s, I think it was, and the problem was exploding pants. Now, if you'd like to hear more about that, perhaps listen to the podcast. Uh, we did have a bit of fun making it, and uh, I think my other host did a fantastic job of explaining some of the research. It involves things like yawning tortoises and wasabi fire alarms, and it's just marvelous stuff. 
Yeah, and that is that exploding pants is not a shadow of an exaggeration either. No, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it was one of the hazards of farming back in the day. Okay. Anyway. Uh, also, it is still World Space Week at this point in time, so just a heads up that there are now six episodes of the World Space Week Association um, podcast up online. Um, they're linked through my blog, which is called Just So Science, up at SciBlogs, and there's a whole bunch of other resources uh, coming up and other activities that you can get involved with in the last couple of days of World Space Week, so definitely take a look at that if you're interested. Yeah, I can vouch for those uh, those podcasts. They're absolutely fascinating, the people that uh, Elf and Harry Tina have been talking with. Great, great, great stuff. <laughs> cool. Well, other than that... Um just looking through our calendar for the rest of the week, and I can't find anything. Amy? <laughs> um, I can actually see some cool stuff. Um, there is, so if I'm just having a look here at the Science Media Center's um, <laughs> calendar, that's uh, it, okay. Um, there are a couple. So on Tuesday, there are two events. The first is of life and earthquake science in the red zone. That's going to be happening here in Wellington and is a talk being given by Dr. Mark Quigley, who is Senior Lecturer in Active Tectonics and Geomorphology at the University of Canterbury. So uh, that should be quite interesting. Uh, then there's another talk um, down in Canterbury itself entitled Scott in New Zealand, official version or the truth? Uh, that'll be presented by Baden Norris. Um, I'd probably get along to that one if I could, but it's a bit far for me. Uh, on Wednesday, there's How Far Should We Push Growing Demands on Atmospheric Chemistry? That's a seminar by Professor Martin Manning, um, and that's going to be here in uh, uh, Wellington as well at VUW. Um, then there is from the 13th to the 16th, so for many days next week, there's the New Zealand Clean Energy Expo, which should be absolutely fascinating. Now that's in Taupo. Um, so looking, uh, it's a number of people coming along. There's the New Zealand Geothermal Association seminar on direct use using low temperature technologies. There's uh, talks about geothermal energy. There are cocktails. There are energizing biomaterials. Just some really, really, really great stuff. Um, and also Thursday is when the abstracts are due for a science policy conference next year. So, in fact, it's the inaugural Asia-Pacific Science Policy Studies Research Conference, which I imagine will be fascinating. So do have a look there, and, and of course, uh, don't forget to send in your abstracts. Absolutely. And one tip of the hat to an event we're both involved with, um, Throughout this week and next week, we'll be going through the heats and then the finals of the Victoria University's first ever Tell Us a Story competition. This is a storytelling competition for postgraduate students to come and they have seven minutes each to present the best story that they can um, <laughs> about their experience with science and and slash or engineering. They should be really, really good. Um, the heats are from 5 to 7.30 p.m. up at Victoria University on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings this week. And the finals are held on Monday evening next week at Club Ivy and on Thursday evening next week mm. um, at the Memorial Lecture Theatre here up here in the Student Union building at Victoria. Uh, but check out the blogs if you want more information on these. Yeah, it's going to be, I, I can't wait to see sort of all these young science communicators and the great stories that they've come up with. It's been great seeing them grow throughout the process. It's <laughs> been very, very cool. Absolutely marvellous. So we'll hope to see at least some of you there next week. All right, and I think that's us for this week. Uh, as, as always, a shout out to the Science Media Center for the use of their calendar and their audio gear. And to Rian Sheehan for our intro and outro themes. Mm-hmm. To um, Victoria University for letting us use the rooms, and to all of our listeners for actually listening. <laughs> yeah. So as always, do check out the uh, accompanying blog post. That's at cyblogs.co.nz forward slash TOSP, T-O-S-P. Um, everything we've spoken about will be linked to there. And uh, do get in touch with questions or comments or criticisms or anything else you like. See you next week. Bye. <laughs>